Hi everyone, my name is Jesse. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Boris FX. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are featuring our 2019.5 new releases of Sapphire, Mocha, and Continuum. Um, it's also kind of like a little peek at what we'll be showing at Seagraph um, in LA next week. Our host today and presenter is Ben Brownlee. He's actually the newest member of the Boris FX team. He is the Director of Learning and Content. Um, you'll probably recognize him if you follow a lot of our MOCA trainings. He's done a lot of fundamental series on MOCA as well as Continuum. He's a digital media specialist and he specializes in post-production, VFX, and production. Um, Today, we'll be covering new features in the 2019.5 releases. Ben will show you how to create a complex warping effect using Mocha's new export to CC power pin option. You'll also create and track complicated rotospines using Mocha's new magnetic and edge snapping tools. You'll learn how to what makes a good lens flare and how to bring it to life using Sapphire's renowned S lens flare and the new and improved flare designer. On the continuum side, we'll be featuring particle illusion, and you'll learn how to easily make editorial particle effects um, inside your NLE. You'll learn how to create and track customized fire effects onto footage, also using particle illusion, and you'll learn how to use particle illusion's presets, how you can tweak them, and um, how tweaks make a big impact on your final result. We'll be answering your questions live. Uh, Brian Fox is also on this webinar. He's the Director of Product Marketing and he'll be answering any product questions you have. Simply type your question into the interface and we'll answer them as soon as we can. If you stay till the end of the webinar, we are giving away uh, four one-year subscriptions, one to the Boris FX bundle, which features all three products, a one-year subscription to Continuum, one to Sapphire, and one to Mocha Pro. Um, to thank you for joining us today, we're offering a special discount code, which is 15% off any individual product. That includes new purchases, annual subscriptions, or any of the upgrade paths. Um, the code is web as in webinar, July the month and 19. And you'll also follow uh, send, sorry, we'll, we'll also be sending you a follow-up email that includes this coupon code as well. And finally, if you'd like to visit us, we are everywhere on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And now, Ben, if you're ready, I'm gonna to toss it over to you. I am ready, I think. Let's have a look. Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Great, well, hello everyone, and uh, yeah, welcome. We've got a lot to go through, so I'm actually not gonna to do too much talking in the intro. I'm actually just gonna start off by showing you what we're gonna do with our first shot. So we're gonna start off in Mocha and we're gonna use one of the new features that's available in Mocha 2015, which is being able to uh, take out a uh, track directly to CC Power Pin. And the reason that's important is that gives us uh, the ability to do some quite interesting little warp effects like, well, this girl and her zombie mouth um, very, very easily. Obviously she can't, open her mouth in such a big zombie way. So let's show you what the original looks like. It's a little bit darker, obviously. So I'll uh, just tweak this up a little bit so we can see what's going on. So what you would you know, really do here, or what you want to do here is we're gonna use a warping tool. We're gonna to use a liquify to open up the mouth a little bit more. Uh, but because she moves her head around a lot, that could involve a lot of keyframes and we don't like keyframing. In fact, I especially don't like keyframing. Anytime that I have to do manual keyframing, I get a little bit err uh, because there's always a better way of doing it. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is actually just come up and try and track this through using Mocha Pro. I've already got one up there. Let's just open this. I will continue on at proxy size because we don't really mind that. And again, I'll also just brighten up my viewer here a little bit for you. So because I'm working at quite a low resolution for the for the webinar, things are going to be a little bit kind of squeezed in, but I'll, I'll do my best. In fact, what I'm going to do is turn this into the new essentials mode. So that hides away a lot of the uh, the, the stuff that you don't really need to, to be looking at right at this very moment. So it gives us a nice big viewer for us to, uh, to work with. OK. So. The first thing to do is actually just look at the movement of what we're doing with the girl here and just deciding how we're going to be doing the tracking. Uh, and she's moving ahead quite a lot. Uh, we want to do a head track, but we can't track in the whole face because obviously her lower jaw 
is going to be moving up and down. So we don't really want that. And so I'm going to take my X spline and just come up and draw around the head, around about there. Nothing too big or clever. I'll make this a different color so it's easier to see on the webinar. What I also have to be aware of, because she turns her head to the side, uh, we're going to see her nose move as well. That's not going to be great for Mocha because Mocha is a, a planar tracker. Um, so instead of tracking points, it tracks that entire texture. The thing is, as soon as that nose turns sideways, that's not part of the, the plane anymore. So that's not a coplanar shape. So we're going to just exclude the, no uh, exclude the noise and the nose and try and just get this little mask over the top here. So now I'm ready to track. I'm just going to track that forwards to begin with. Now that looks all right. Uh, I'm going to turn on my grid up at the top here so that we can start to sort of just see what's going to happen. And I'm going to track backwards. Now, this is going to fall down at some point. And it's going to fall down because obviously she brings her head down. And that's fine. I don't really care about that because by the time she brings her head down, I'm I'm lost interest in, you know, in the track because I don't I only actually need to get a decent track when her head is uh up and her mouth is open. So so far, so good. I'm just scrubbing that through. And if we've got nice consistent motion with the grid, then I've got nice consistent motion with the track. And that's that's looking all right, I think. Uh, so I'm going to turn off some of the, the uh, overlays here so we don't have to look at that. So the next thing I need to do is come in, let's just zoom in a little bit more. And we have to deal with the surface. Now, the surface is where we're going to be putting all of our data, basically, or where we're going to be taking the data out when we take it out of Mocha. And we can take this surface, this plane to surface, and sort of rotate it around, transform it into place. And what I'm looking for here is to take out her head and actually just her face there. And it's something that's relatively 16 by nine. That's not actually all that important for what we're gonna do. It's just gonna help us a little bit when we're uh, coming in and, and uh, stabilizing stuff up. So now I've got all the data I need. This is, this is quite nice. So I don't have to do anything or export anything at this point. I can just exit out and everything obviously looks the same. So uh, let's just duplicate that layer. I'll just uh, use control D there. And I'm going to come into the tracking data because now we have to tell Mocha what to do with that tracking data. So we're going to create it up and it's layer one because obviously I didn't take the three seconds it would take to, uh, to change the name. It's very bad of me, but uh, there we are. And I'm going to come down to the export option now. And we've got corner pin, corner pin exports, motion blur, and transform. So the three ones we've we've always had. But now we have another little one, which is the CC power pin. And I'm going to choose what layer I'm going to export this to. I'm going to export it to its own layer. Hit apply export. And there we go. We have our finished effects. No, no, we don't. No. Uh, what we've done is we've got like the classic corner pin going on in there. So it's it's fitting in. Stick it on, it actually looks quite funny, um, but that's not the effect we want. So if I come into CC Power Pin now, CC Power Pin has this little function that's called unstretch. If I click on unstretch, it pushes the corners of our surface out to the edges. So that's why it was really important when we were in Mocha to actually get that uh, surface set up where we needed it to go. So now that's looking pretty stable. I mean, the, the background's moving all around, but her face is looking pretty stable. So I'm liking where we're going with this. So I'm gonna make another effect on this one and I'm gonna come up to distort and liquefy. I'll just double click so that we can come into the liquefy area here, shift this around a little bit. And I'm gonna use my liquefy tool now change up the warp tool options. I find with this sort of work, if you have quite a large brush size and not so large a, or not so high a brush pressure, that tends to work nicely. And I'm just gonna use this just to auto save. Thank you, After Effects, very good. 
There we go. Yeah, I'm just going to use this just to shape up the mouth a little bit, just to expand that out and give us this kind of otherworldly, unnatural sort of look. Um, so a nice sort of almost like a snake mouth almost. Just really open that up. And obviously I can take a little bit more time with this, but hopefully you'll get the idea as we're sort of pushing through for the webinar here. So if we look at the before and after on that, it's kind of looking all right. The only thing I need to look out for is at the very, very bottom edge, I don't want any of those pixels moving because if any of those pixels move, it's going to give the game away a little bit later. So I'm going to come to my reconstruct tool, take the brush size down on this one. So I don't need this quite as big and come back over here. Make sure I've got that selected and just make sure that we have nothing moving no pixels just that's the last my last little tip on that is just to unliquify that stuff so now that's looking that's looking all right and as we scrub through we've got this nice big unnaturally large mouth the only thing is when our mouth is shut we get this kind of moon face which i'm not really uh i'm not really digging so we're going to just uh, add a couple of quick keyframes here so uh, let's come in, add my uh, dis uh, distortion percentage up to 100, come back to where our mouth is shut, take my distortion percentage down to zero. She opens her mouth again there. So let's add another keyframe here, bring that up, see if this is going to work. This may not work without some extra transformations, but actually that does. That's kind of cool. It's a nice little. Uh, Nice little surprise there, just to keyframe that down a little bit. And as her head dips down, we can take that back down to zero. And because we don't want to see that anymore, I'm just going to shorten out the uh, layer as well. So if we come back to our composition and just uh, play that back, obviously that's going to uh, round cache through and probably look a little bit uh, stuttery on your end. I'll just scrub that through instead. So now we've got our mouth looking how we want it to look. That's kind of nice. So the last thing we have to do is kind of reverse that effect. And that's that's really easy to do. Uh, all I'm going to do is just duplicate this CC uh, power pin, bring that to the bottom. Oh, I've got a huge eye. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to turn off unstretch. So it needs to be below the liquify to reverse what the first power pin was doing. So if we turn that off, we get that, if we turn it back on, everything sits back into place. So instead of having to sort of chase ourselves around, what we've done is stabilize the, the frame up and then destabilized it at the very end. So this is uh, called reverse stabilization or uh, stabilize, destabilize. So if we just do a quick round preview of that again with the, uh, maybe it's a little bit dark as well on your screens, Let's brighten up just a tiny bit we can get the final effect. And we've managed to pull that off in about, yeah, just less than 10 minutes, which I think is kind of kind of fun. So we've got the uh, the original and then the after there. So we can sort of pull that and bring that up uh, a bit more as well. Um, we can do that with other stuff. If I just play back this, this has got exactly the same uh, thing done to it that uh, reverse stabilization so the stabilize instead of um, liquify I've painted on this and then destabilized again to take out that lovely lip ring so maybe a lip ring is a, a bridge too far for a particular client they like the nose ring but the lip ring is no good so you can just easily paint that back up and we'll see what that looks like just isolating that layer out and it's done exactly the same thing. So we've we've used the CC power pin to stabilize that, paint it up, and then destabilize it again. It's a very, very powerful technique that you can use for a whole host of different things. Um, and that's that's something I really like. So that's the CC power pin export that we now have available to us. Cool. If we move on to the next shot, actually, let's look at the um, before first. 
what I'm going to do here is actually show a couple of the other things or other features that we have for speeding up some of our rotoscoping. Now, I happen to be probably the only person in the, in the world that actually really likes rotoscoping. But, uh, you know, anything that can make that a little bit faster is, uh, is always good with me. So if we take a look at the movement here, and we're going to just try and take out the, the hand. Hands are always a bit tricky. The hand isn't moving very well, so uh, very much. So we can actually probably do this in one complex shape. Normally I wouldn't do that if it was moving, but one complex shape is probably quite pretty good. And we have our magnetic roto spline here. Now, the difference with this and the other uh, splines that we had in, in Mocha is that I can just click once and then just be drawing along the edge and then maybe clicking again. And it tries to find the edge for me. And so I can, oh, if it, there we go. And if it doesn't find anything, if, if it gets a little bit confused here at any point, I can just hold down the Alt or Option key. That's not a very good one. There we go, let's try again. Alt or Option key and just draw around the areas where it's being a bit tricky. And then it will pick that up afterwards. So hold down the Option key, come along here, hold down the Option key, back over to the end, and then just right click to finish off our shape. And the nice thing about this is, and let's go into the right frame, there we go, is once we've drawn that, it will then go and draw this as a spline. And if it's a bit too complicated, we can always just turn the detail down at any point or turn the detail up if we need to add a little few, uh, a few more points in. I tend to try to you know, err on the side of fewer points is better because you know, we, we then don't have uh, as many points to have to worry about when we're doing the tracking or when we're doing any sort of uh, corrections to it, I should say. Cool, so let's come up, maybe just, there we go. That's looking, that's looking all right, I'm happy with that. And I will actually name this one, hand track, and we'll track that one forwards. Looking all right, come in and we'll track that backwards. Now we are gonna see a little bit of slippage, a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is we're seeing different stuff as the hand rotates around, we're seeing new areas of the hand that we weren't seeing before. Uh, the other reason is I've probably chosen too big a shape. So where it's slipping, you see around here, what I'd normally do is actually just come in, I'd hold down the control or command key and try to sort of just distort that into place and that works out quite nicely over here. There we go. And maybe just taking in a few points just there. The other thing we can do though, if I zoom in over to this angle, or over to this area where things, where points aren't quite matching, is I can use the new snapping feature. So if I hold uh, or press Alt and S, Mocha is gonna try to snap those points into the uh, into the right place. So if I come over to the start again, just pan over here somewhere, take these, Alt S, it will try and snap those into place. Obviously, it's you know it's not going to do a hundred percent of the work for us. We're still uh, we're still going to have to do a bit of a uh, bit of work afterwards, but it can you know try and shortcut. There we go. Try and shortcut some of that. Um, effort that you have to put in. And we bring that into there. There we go. And we'll just do that in there. That's very nice. So that's that's kind of cool. So we're looking just at the edge of that hand because I haven't touched the other side yet. So that's kind of nice. I have a little bit of uh, of slipping over here, but actually it's looking it's looking all right. And the cool thing about this and this feature is that it's not just available in Mocha Pro. Um, if you're working with Boris Continuum uh, and you've used any of the uh, Pixel Chooser features, functionality, you'll know that you have a version of Mocha built directly into Pixel Chooser. Uh, so if I had a fast film process, I just wanna do something quick with this, make it a little bit cooler on one side, just to, to boost up the, uh, the warmth of his hand on the other side. 
Actually, where, where did I start? I started off with Cool Wash, that'll do. So if I come to the Pixel Chooser and to the Mocha Mask, let's uh, continue that as well. I'm not gonna make you sit through me doing the whole thing again. I am going to come into my webinar and here's one I made earlier. Da da da. There we go. And if we come over to the hand over here now, I do. I can do exactly the same thing. It's just zoom in a little bit. So if I do my Alt and S, that's going to try to fit that onto the right area, and that's done a, a good job on that. So I can save, exit that out. Where are we? Just invert that. Maybe give that a bit of a a blur as well. Just feather that mask. And we can very easily start to get some more complex roto shapes going on. Now, time is time is really, really slipping away from me. That's that's all the time I've got for Mocha. If you've got any questions, don't forget to actually put them in the chat. If uh, if it's something that Jesse or Brian can't answer, I will get to them uh, a bit later on in the webinar. It's now time to look at one of my favorite things which is lens flares. I absolutely love lens flare. Whenever I, I'm shooting something, I'm always getting told off for uh, for putting lens flares in everything. It's like, don't point the camera at the sun, the camera goes the other way. But I actually think that lens flares add a, a real sort of life and, and kind of, I don't know, sort of mystery to a, to a shot. Because they can, they can take in, you know, something, in this case, it's, it's actually something quite graphic. And sort of dance around and give this a, a little bit of life and maybe I've gone a little bit too far with the lens flares there but you know it doesn't have to be something as bold as that it could be something just as simple as adding just a little bit of a ring around this this sun here just kind of boosting that up or it could be coming in and trying to help you sort of like tie together a lot of other effects so if you've got a, a sort of VFX heavy shot, sticking a lens flare on or just a little bit of uh, lens flare glow, you know, that can help to tie stuff together. But the important thing is it is, you know, you have to have an appropriate lens flare. Um, so if we come into my tunnel here, we just play this through, tunnel with no flares on at all. The type of lens flare that we use actually really does kind of give and set the mood for you know what the uh, what the type of, of project or type of film is you're working on so before we've had some sort of uh you know sci-fi sort of things we've got a more natural one here again something more kind of sci-fi high tech uh and here we have if i just stop this just before it gets gets going here we have something that uh that hopefully you'll all recognize this is our, our classic lens flare. You know, this is this is the lens flare that we've been seeing for you know 25 years um, in all types of advertising and TV shows. You can always pick up this little distinctive lens flare. Uh, the reason I don't like this particular lens flare is that it's it's dead. You know, not only because we've seen it a hundred times, but because it doesn't really do anything. You know, if I look at real world lens flares, real world lens flares kind of move around they've got something special they've they can you know they convey something different they can they convey stuff about the glass they convey stuff about the um the type of light uh, and they sort of dance around and it's they're, they're interesting uh, i have spent many hours in darkened rooms uh pointing lights at different types of lenses uh, with different types of cameras don't know what that says about me but i seem to enjoy it so when we're coming into to looking at lens flares that's that's the kind of stuff that i'm thinking about all the times like does this lens flare have life is it is it fun is it something that would exist in this particular world that we're we're trying to uh, to make up so in this case we're going to use s lens flare to do something a little bit kind of graphic and kind of just make something a little bit shiny we're not going to end up with this exact uh, look. We're going to end up with something a little bit different, but it's it's going to be fun. So usually 
if I was going to add a lens flare, I would have added it to just a simple black solid. With uh, Sapphire 2019.5, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to add it to the the layer itself. This was this was obviously always an option, but I was I was just felt that adding it to a, a black solid gave me a little bit more uh, kind of uh, flexibility. But if I come into edit my lens, there's a few new things here that actually um, make it a lot more compelling to add it to your your footage instead. Uh, what I will do is let's uh, turn off the noise there for a second. So when I've come into the uh, the flare designer, this uh, sort of flare builder, we've always been able to sort of see what the flare is doing in you know on a on a still image and see how it sort of dances around and does fun stuff like that. What we're now able to do is we're now able to play back our clip within, there we go, within the um, uh, the builder itself, the flare designer. So we get, you know, not the whole clip, we're getting five seconds of the clip, but this is enough to see whether a flare is working in context. So we can start to kind of just, yeah, get a bit better of an idea if if a particular flare is going to be suitable not just for one particular frame but how it's going to work in the uh, in the entire animation uh, we do have a lot more uh, presets with this new version but i'm going to come into the featured presets because there are a lot of really nice ones that i've made in here uh, so i know i both know and love them there we go so let's come down, we'll have a look at, uh, I'll just tap a few of these as we're going through, just to see if I can find one that I really like. Industrial is pretty cool, but actually I think we're gonna go with uh, reflective. And the reason we're looking at reflective here is because it's it's got a lot of the stuff that I actually really like. I'm gonna turn off show background for a second, just so we can see the lens flare. And if you're not familiar with the flare designer, we do have the ability as well to just sort of solo out the selection so we can see just individual elements, either individual groups, or if I open up my uh, folders here, we see individual elements as well. So you can start to see how small bits actually function as I drag the hotspot around. So you see, we've got these just tiny tiny elements that all go into building up this uh main flare there we go and i'm just going to focus on the hot spot to begin with because that's that's the interesting bit for me right now in fact i'm not even going to use this hot spot i'm going to build a hot spot of my very own so i'm going to come up and uh to the top elements up here or if i want to i can come to my components and these are basically presets, but not presets for the entire flare. They're presets for little elements of the flare. So if I happen to know that I want a, uh, uh, where are we? Sort of like a, a halo here, for example, I can just add the halo in to my, uh, to my uh, main lens flare, and that will add to the lens flare rather than replace it. I don't want to add a, a halo in this case, though. I'm going to go with just a little warm glow, actually, or a spot glow, even better. Nope, warm glow. And I'm going to turn my noise off, That uh, the uh, little clouds we saw there. I'm just going to turn those off. Cool. So in the warm glow, we have a couple of elements. We have this large, uh, large blob which I can resize and I can change the color on and we can do all of these. There we go, nice. And we have a small blob as well. So I can do the same sort of thing. I can change the size, change the color. So we've got something a little bit different here. And one of the interesting things that we can start to do is, is try and give this a little bit of life as well. Uh, and the way that we do this is by, well, one of the ways is by changing up the position. So the position changes how things are, are working in relation to the hotspot. So the purple one is the hotspot itself. 
and the large one is the one we've changed the position on. So if the position is set to one, then let's move this over to one. There we go. So the position set to one, this is going to move along with the hotspot. If it's set to minus one, it's going to move in the exact sort of opposite way to the hotspot. And it's using this sort of idea that we can start to, you know, build up some more interesting effects. So same with animation. If I bring in, uh, actually, this I want this to also be at one, not minus one. There we go. So with the animation, what we can do here is we can have this scaling up as it moves closer to or further away from the center. So in this case, I have it moving. It shrinks as it moves further away. It's kind of interesting. And we can delay that as well using auto scale delay. So we can start to get a little bit of a flare element that has a little bit of life to it, has some interest to it. Uh, I'm not going to do too much more with this because I have just seen what the time is, unfortunately. Uh, but we are going to do a little bit more interesting stuff with this before we leave. There we go. So let's take off our original hotspot. And we have our warm glow, right? So I'm going to hit OK. Let's see how we can start working with this directly within the effect after we've auto saved. Always auto save. There we go. Top tip. So I'm going to take the uh, the width and the brightness down just a, a wee bit. There we go. Actually, take more more like take the width down quite a lot. Excellent stuff. Right. So one of the things that I can do with this is I can set up uh, an occlusion layer. So an occlusion layer is, there we go, occlusion layers mean that the flare reacts to the, fit, uh, the, to the footage that we have itself. So in this case, I've used the, the layer itself. So as we're going behind the letters, obviously the flare is going to react in that way as well. So if I were to keyframe this, uh, let's bring this, start this over here somewhere, and we'll just keyframe the hotspot, and we'll go to the end, and I'm not going to do anything too clever with it, just keyframe the hotspot horizontally over there. Actually, we might just dip it down just a, a wee bit in, in Y as well. There we go. I could use the on-screen controls there. Cool. So now that's just moving along with the, there we go, with the, the text there. So as it goes in front of the text, oh, it shows up. If it goes behind the text, it goes away. We can control this as well. This is something that I like doing with kind of reflective metallic text is coming into my occlusion. Uh, and this this sort of uh, lets us decide how we're going to work with the occlusion. So if I do invert occlusion there, it's going to do the exact opposite, not surprisingly. And at the moment, it's kind of looking really red because it's taking the color from the text that we have here. I'm going to turn off use color. And now we have just our regular little flare going on. So what I want to do now, let's turn off the overlays there so I can adjust this a little bit more, is I can come up to the top again and I can start to adjust a lot of this work, uh, a lot of these um, uh, properties. So I can come in, take the scale width down a bit more. So we're really only getting just a, a touch there. Maybe take that to 30. And I render that back. If I've got that in the right place, which I absolutely have not, that is looking a bit too high. So what I'm going to do is just dip that down so it's only just touching the text there. So now if I ran preview that down, it looks as if when the light is hitting the metallic bits of the text, it's kind of giving it that nice little glint. And it's only doing that because of the occlusion layers. So that's that's quite a nice little effect. 
Uh, and there's, there's absolutely tons of other stuff that we can do with the S lens flare, uh, which we really do not have time for, unfortunately. Uh, before I go or move on, I should say, I am going to come in and add one more filter, or actually one more flare, the same flare, reflective flare, over again. And I'm going to turn off, what am I going to turn off? Actually, we'll keep everything on for now. And hit OK on that. There we go. And let's just bring this behind there. Because what I want to do is I want to show you how we can use that atmosphere. So let's just scale this up a little bit. I say a little bit, a lot. And if I scale it up, I'm going to bring the brightness down. I'm going to keep this quite heavy so that we can see this through the webinar. And I'm going to take the atmosphere amplitude up as well. So with the atmosphere, we can start to get this kind of smoky haze going through. Uh, and obviously, as we bring that up, it affects the other stuff as well. So now we've got rays that are way too bright for what I want. But the nice thing about S lens flare is instead of having to go all the way back into the flare designer to change that, I can actually just come into my raise brightness and just adjust that as a property straight in here. So we don't have to sort of keep going back and forth. We can obviously keyframe all of this up and make it look really nice. You know, that's that's going to be easy to do. But uh, I think hopefully you'll get the idea of, uh, of where we're heading with this now. And as that finishes previewing through, hopefully you can start to see, if I move just scrubbing this through, hopefully you can start to see some of the movement that we've got going on with that atmosphere. Cool. That was far, far too short a, uh, a look at S lens flare, I'm afraid, but we do have to uh, to move over to, um, to particle illusion now. Again, if you've got any more questions, type them into the chat. And uh, if Jesse or Brian can't get to them, I will absolutely get to them at the end of the uh, presentation. Cool. We're going to move out of After Effects now, and we're going to pop into uh, Premiere. And we're back in Premiere. And we're going to have a look at Particle Illusion and some of the changes that we have in, uh, in Particle Illusion, which is part of the Continuum uh, series. So Particle Illusion, as the, the name kind of uh, gives it away, is a particle system. Now, it's a a sort of 2D particle system that's that's actually really great for doing things like uh, motion backgrounds or sort of graphical elements or a lot of natural elements. So things like fire, uh, smoke, water, that sort of stuff. Uh, and what we're going to do is set fire to a building. Uh, so I'm going to come in and let's try and find my effect. I'm going to type in particle and have all of the different particle systems I have available to me as part of Continuum, but I'm going to ignore all of those and use Particle Illusion. And I'm going to click on Launch Particle Illusion, and after a couple of seconds, there we go, the Particle Illusion workspace opens up for me, and it opens up far, far too big because it's not expecting this tiny resolution that I have. There we go. So. There's a lot of presets that come with Particle Illusion. There's, there's actually thousands of presets that come with Particle Illusion. Um, so to help make it easier, there we go, we can sort of wiggle that around to the preview. Yeah, to help make that easier to actually find the particle that you're looking for, there's a nice little search box right at the top. So if I type in fire, we're actually going to see a lot of different types of fire that we have available to us you know even with fire we have you know all of these presets it's quite a lot of presets uh, and this is you know this is a, a great sort of starting point for you to actually make your, your own stuff as well so i'm looking for just like a general fiery fire which is Inferno intensive, that's maybe a little bit too intense. All right, I'm going to go with uh, with fire three here. 
So this is just our preview window for the uh, for the presets. If I come over here, and maybe let's just fit that up in here. Let's see. Hang on a second. Let's see. There we go. Let's bring us back into our default views there. Let's delete that. And let's come back out and see what's going on here. Okay. Cool. Right. So let's composite that over the source video and let's find our fire one more time. And what do we agree on? We agreed on something like fire three, wasn't it? Or something in that in that vein. Oh, uh, there we go. Fire three. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Now the nice thing about this, I can just double click and it adds something onto my onto my viewer there. And it's starting not at the, the first frame because I didn't have my CTI pressed at the first frame, but there we go. And I can choose, whoa. I obviously hadn't finished off the effect. There we go. I still had my my Wacom tablet drifting over there. That's looking a little bit a little bit big. Let's come in. There we go. Hit escape. There we are. Better. Yeah, I can come in. I can just kind of decide where I want to, to loop this viewer around. I'm not really interested in the whole of the clip. I'm just going to loop around a little bit of it. So that's that's looking kind of inferno-y for us. Uh, I'm going to place this into an area where I want to start the fire. And now I can come to my properties and start to actually change all this stuff up as well. Now, I wanted an inferno, but this is too big an inferno. I'm going to take my, my zoom down a little bit there just to make that a bit smaller. In fact, if I'm making that smaller, we might as well zoom this up just a, a little bit as well. There we go. I'm holding down shift, oh, sorry, space to uh, be able to pan around. Cool. So that's that's looking all right. That's fiery. If we want to make any changes to this, we can uh, either come up to the, the properties in the emitter itself, and we can change things like the number of frames to preload or the random seed. So this is going to change the randomness in the uh, in the emitter so that we're getting something that looks a little bit different than the default. This is nice if we're using sort of multiple emitters that uh, of the same sort of um, uh, the same same type of, of preset. We want them to look different. Just change the emitter up, and that does it for you. We can also add a um, a tint color to this. So if we tinted this yellow, and come down to our tint strength, we can tint all that up. Now, obviously, the problem doing it this way with this particular emitter is that it also tints up the smoke that we had. So we don't really want yellow smoke. That's not really what we're after. What I can do though, is I can come down and dive deep down into here and we can open up all of the various different elements that make up this one emitter. So we've got lots of different particles working together to create this fire effect. So I can come into fire here I can come into my colors and I can change up the uh, the color here. I can maybe make this a little bit more red or more, uh, push it more towards the yellow. Uh, let's make it more red so you can actually see what it's doing. There we go, definitely more red. Some would say too red, they would be right. And I'll move that a little bit more to the uh, to the yellow there. But with the newer version, we don't just have the colors to play around with. We can also change what the emitter shape is going to be. So if I click on the, the, the shape type, we can actually, if I move this over to the side, we can have a look at all of the different shapes that we have available in this particular library. And all of these libraries on the left hand side have different shapes within them. Um, now, the fun thing is, if we don't find one that we really like, uh, we've got a lot. Actually, ooh, Actually, splash is looking pretty cool there. Um, if we do find one that we don't, or we can't find one that we like, I can come to import a shape and 
let's have a little look here uh, into particles. I can import my own shapes if I want to. And we can sort of bring those in and use those instead. Uh, I actually like that as well. I'm not sure whether I like that as much as the splash, but let's have a little look. Actually, I do. I've uh, this is this is uh, a revelation for me in the webinar. I've never actually got to this stage. I've always uh, used the uh, the splash instead. But I actually prefer that one. That shape is is more kind of light streak one, but this is, it actually turns into a really nice fire. This is cool. So I'm going to hit apply on that, and that's going to apply this into Premiere. Now, if anyone can shout at their uh, computer monitor as loudly as possible, uh, especially if you're in a crowded office, what is wrong with this so far, uh, then you get a cookie. Uh, the biggest problem I see is that it's not moving. Uh, there's, there's no kind of uh, movement on that at all. But we can change that. We can actually make transforms directly uh, within our, our host. So we can either change the world. If the camera's moving, we change the world. If the emitter's moving, so the, the particle itself is moving along. So say we're uh, doing a smoke trail behind a, um, uh, a jet plane or a uh, rocket, something like that, then the emitter's moving. Or if both the camera and the emitter are moving, we can have world plus emitter. But I'm just gonna do a world here. And we can keyframe all of this up. Or even better, if I go a little bit further down, we have the motion tracker built in. And guess what motion tracker it is? Yep, that's right, it is Mocha. So this is great because it's a sort of, you know, we don't have to use it as a, a big full blown version of Mocha. We have these things like world center search area set up for us and the world center set up for us already. So I could just use this um, as like the world's, you know, poshest point tracker. Obviously it's not a point tracker, because it's um, it's still the Mocha plane tracker, so it's that it's got that robust trackeriness to it uh, that you don't have with a point tracker. So it's, you know it's able to track things uh, like through motion blur or through noisy footage. You know it's it's a lot more robust than just a um, a regular point tracker would be. But we're just taking out this one point of data, this world center that we actually need. So that's uh, quite uh, kind of cool and interesting. And as we finish up our track, don't have to do anything clever with this. I just have to save or just have to, have to exit and that'll save it out. And there's our track. Because I played around with the world center, the offset, I can just play around with the offset again, rather than going back into Mocha, I can just do it within the, the parameters over here and just adjust that into the right place. And now if I wanted to do uh, anything else with it, obviously I could, or I could just uh, start to render this through. Um, if we had any more time, which unfortunately we don't, because I'm completely out of time now, I would add on sort of more smoke and uh, more smoky effects and sort of more fire. And they would also all use that same motion tracking data. So we don't have to track it once, and then we can use that time and time again for all of the particles that are attached to our shape here. Um, we can also use Mocha to do masking as well, just in the same way as we did with the Pixel Chooser with the fast film effects. Um, and again, that is my very, very quick look at some of the uh, some of the cool new stuff in Particle Illusion. There's more stuff that we didn't get a chance to, uh, to look through, but uh, hopefully you'll join me again where we take a slightly deeper dive at some of these some of these subjects. So thank you very much for now. I'm going to pass you back over to uh, Jesse, yes. and we'll do our last little bit. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thanks, Ben. Um, before we get to questions, I just want to quickly mention who won the prizes. Congratulations to Tino Gomez, who has won the one-year Boris FX bundle. Congratulations to Meredith Moore, who has won the one-year subscription to Sapphire. Congratulations to Buzzy Rolfing, who has won the one-year subscription to Continuum. And congratulations to Sarah Polly, who has won the one-year subscription to Mocha Pro. Um, you'll be receiving emails from me shortly. Um, Brian, do you want to go, go over any questions? 
Uh, sure. Thanks, Ben. That was, that was an awesome demonstration. Excited to have you on the team. Um, we had one question. I mean, we over, overall had some great questions in the forum, but there was one, hopefully you can explain. Uh, Babe Forum had asked, um, the theory behind destabilizing, is it, yes. is it really painting on duplicated footage that has been tracked and copied so, and that, that you undo so the painting becomes its own layer on top of the original footage? Uh, but, well, you could do it like that if you wanted to. Let's, let's have a look at that um, back over here. I'm just going to isolate that out. So just to show you what I've got in Mocha, let's continue this in here. Uh, so I've got my, my track, I've done a, a sort of slightly different type of, uh, of face track in this, but the end result is the same. So I've just taken out my, my shape, which is the, the blue square there, which is going over the lips. So once we've got that, I've then come in and put that into the CC power pin. And, it and by clicking on unstretch, it pushes the corners of that surface to the, to the corners of our, uh, of our area. So basically now when we're painting, if I was to paint on uh, transparent here, we're, we can't even see that obviously. God dear. Yeah, what we're doing with the, with the paint is we are uh, coming in and just painting over the top of this stabilized frame. So it's not a still frame. That's, that's what makes this uh, so powerful is that it's still the moving, the moving footage. So we're able to take things like, you know, when we're, we're cloning, we can clone the noise in as well. So it, it looks, you know, it looks right. Um, and then once we're happy with that paintwork, what we do is then reverse that uh, stabilization. So we, we destabilize it again. Gotcha. And that just, the effect of that, the unstretch and the, the stretching again, just puts that over the top. So it puts it back into its original place. So that when we look at it, in context, we don't see it just as the uh, as the lips here. We see it as you know the lips on top of the face. the The gotcha. nice thing about this is that if we're doing warping, we can be a little bit more cavalier with the uh, the tracking than we otherwise would be. Uh, with painting, you still want to have like the obviously the best uh, the best most stable track you can absolutely get because otherwise you'll be painting over stuff that, that starts slipping a little bit. But uh, you know, that's, that's obviously the great thing about Mocha is that you do get a very good solid track with, uh, with a bit of effort, actually with minimal effort, what am I saying? Cool. Um, how about this question I, I didn't know the answer to. In, in particle illusions, can the emitters be affected by another force? Like for example, like yes. wind cutting into the smoke? Absolutely brilliant question. This is something that I really wanted to get to, but we literally just ran out of time. Gotcha. Um, we do have uh, things like deflectors and we have forces. So deflectors, if I just draw a deflector there, uh, a deflector is like a wall. So if we, we push that in there, it's like a wall just pushing pushing down on our force. Or if we have something with a lot of bounce, uh, which we don't with the smoke, but if we had something uh, like um, uh, snow, for example, or you know a magic wand, you know we can we can deflect that and it will deflect back and bounce and, and look really nice and cool. Uh, if we didn't want to deflect and we wanted something a bit windier, then we have these forces. So if I had a force, just click on that there. I can move that around a little bit uh, and change the the strength up. This is basically, yeah, this is, this is like a wind. If I, if I bring this strength up there, you can start to see the flames start to, to move around. So you can see the, the wind pushing the flames out. So with the, there we go. So with the, the strength set down to zero or a negative number, there we go, set down to zero, it's not doing anything, or we can have it pushing out quite far. Uh, and obviously we can change things like the direction, uh, we can change the angle that you're pointing at and change the width and the height and all that sort of stuff. It's it's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of flexibility to it. And you can have multiple deflectors, multiple forces, all working uh, on the same project. Cool. 
No, that that answers it. Thank you for that explanation. Cool. Thank you. Um, a lot, of the, a lot of the other questions we we had in there um, were specifically things like some some GPU questions. Um, people wanted some clarification. Um, you know, just just so people know, like you know, like Mocha is GPU accelerated. We use OpenCL. Um, that being said, it, it works with the latest NVIDIA cards. If you're lucky enough to have um, some of the brand new NVIDIA. Um, Turing GPUs, um, Mocha sees some significant speed speed increases with those. Um, trying to look them through else. Anything now? I think we I think we pretty much got everything. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for the fantastic presentation, Ben. Um, look forward to doing more in the future with you. Yeah, it's going to be good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.